Uh, back live with you tonight. And thanks uh, for staying on. The agricultural sector has added 27,000 jobs in the first quarter of the year. It comes as uh, the industry experienced a bumper season due to Good rains in the many parts of the country. Agricultural Minister Togo Didiza joins us now for more on this. Minister, good evening. Good to have you. And thank you very much uh, for your time. Let, let me start where I just uh, touched now with uh, uh, Ashley Benjamin, that the agricultural sector seemingly creating more jobs in terms of percentage share than the percentage share of the contribution that you are making to the GDP. I looked at the number, it says agriculture 5.4% while your share to GDP is 1.5%. What, what are you particularly doing right that you, you are able to, 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 to do that? Well, thank you very much, Tavo and the listeners. Um, I must say that Policy certainty, it's one of those uh, interventions that make it possible for industry to uh, actually participate and invest in the sector. The regulatory environment as well, but also the support that is given uh, to farmers and the good rains, as you have said earlier, that it has also contributed in this regard. I think the sector itself, meaning the farmers and agribusinesses, have really had investment consistently in the sector, but also the innovation that has been introduced. And this happened despite the challenges that we've been facing, the increased uh, cost of production owing to the cost of fertilizer and other agrochemicals. Still, we have seen this growth in employment that we've seen. You are correct to say, at times, the direct contribution of primary agriculture into the GDP might look smaller. However, you look at the multiplier effect of the sector, both in its downstream and upstream, you will find that there is more than a percentage contribution to the GDP arising out of the agricultural sector as a whole. Yeah. Are, are you, I mean, uh, which I suppose is, is, is the commitment of this, this particular administration that uh, all the, the ministries are going to coordinate and work together in, in terms of uh, yes. ensuring that the challenges of the country are being uh, uh, addressed. But the, the farmers, for example, raise one issue. One of the biggest challenges in the farming is, is load shedding, and they would have uh, articulated that with you and asked for intervention to assist them. But the other issues are dollar strength, which... Uh, by and large, most of it has, has also got to do with the geopolitical environment that we are in, our leanings uh, in, in, in terms of those geopolitics and how they, they affect the performance of the rent. What conversations are you having around that? Well, let me say since January this year, we've had conversation with the sector that in, is the primary agricultural producers as well as the agricultural industry where as government uh, we convened the meeting with the sector to look at how we can intervene in the challenges of uh, energy and looking at what the impact of that was in the sector. And I must say that following that meeting, we set up a task team which had to really look and examine what are the cost implications that has arisen as a result of consistent load shedding at stage six. We also engaged uh, ESCOM to look at what we can do to actually assist the sector. We looked at issues of load curtailment, which ESCOM was actually willing to address, working with the producers. But there was also an appreciation that we needed to do something as a sector. That's why last week in our budget speech, we announced the Agro Energy Fund as an intervention to assist farmers to move towards uh, alternative energy sources so that we cannot compromise the food production. But yes, there has been a welcome of this intervention, appreciating, of course, that the resources are not that much, but they will intervene given the challenges that we're facing right now. And we trust that, you know, the sector will utilize this facility to the advantage not only of themselves, but also for food security in the country. The issues that are in the environment, as you indicate, would obviously, and I must say that the geopolitical situation affected the agricultural sector not only uh, this year or maybe based on the decision that as a country we have taken, you know, in terms of our non-aligned position, but the shifts 
that has happened and the disruption as a result of the, you know, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine in itself resulted in disruptions in the agricultural value chain. That's why we saw the cost of agrochemicals, we saw the cost of wheat, cost of fertilizer actually going up. And I must say that we had an advantage as a country that our industry, you know, in terms of their forebuying, particularly when it comes to the wheat, we had already procured to supplement what we produced. That's why the impact was not felt as much. Even in the fertilizer space, yes, there was an impact, but not as um, adverse as we had expected. And that has shown resilience in the sector, but also better planning from our uh, industry. Now, if, if uh, it's good because you and I have this context because we did have this conversation decades ago around barriers to entry for farmers. Now you are uh, 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 addressing the, the, the question of the agro-energy fund. So I'll take you back to the likes of LRAD, to the likes of CASP, how barriers to entry were set quite high and emerging farmers end up saying, well, we can't access these, these kinds of interventions. What are we doing to ensure that uh, the, 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 the intervention that you are, you are putting out uh, is accessible to all farmers? Thank you very much, Tavo. I don't really think that the barriers to entry on the programs that you are indicating were that high. For instance, if you look at the Comprehensive Agricultural Support Program, and litima, litima, those are actually grants. So imagine farmers don't actually pay. They apply, they put a business plan on what they need to do in terms of the infrastructure on farm, yeah. and they, if they're successful in their application, they actually get support. But, but Minister, you know, you know, you and I know that it's, it, was, it was never that easy. They, they never really qualified. You always said it was easy. You just apply, if you qualify, you get it. But they would raise a whole a, a number debate. of issues. I think we can have that debate another time because we need to look exactly at what is happening on the ground, even including LRAD, because in LRAD, the grant proportion was more and contribution was not only monetary. Actually, on contribution included where families were going to be working the land on themselves. Yeah. And yeah. therefore, in terms of the grant proportion, it was much higher than the loan component that they got. But be that as it may, let's come back to the agro industry uh, fund, the agro energy fund rather. There we have looked at the different uh, scales of uh, production. Imagine farmers. We'll actually, in terms of our producer support program, we'll be able to have a combination of 70% grant and 30% loan and capping it at 500,000. For your medium scale farmers, it will be 50 50 in terms of the grant and the loan. And for your commercial farmers, it will be 70% loan and 30% a grant. We do so appreciating the levels at, of entry and ensuring that we ameliorate the barriers for those who are actually smaller and emerging. Yeah. Let's talk about another issue because we'll, we'll run out of time shortly. The, the, the bumper uh, 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 order coming from China of, 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 of our crop, is that something that uh, uh, is, is sustainable going forward? And um, was it a political posturing? No, we are actually uh, exporting uh, our crops, not only maize, fruits, meat, you know, perishable products we export to the region as well as, uh, you know, internationally. So we actually, people would make orders early on depending on the availability from farmers that would sell. But we have always had self-sufficiency for our own production. So we are not uh, worried about consumption at local level and whether what we have will provide for us and our region that we always secure. And the international export always happens 
in this industry. What we're excited about is that in the coming season, we will actually see the bumper crop not only coming from the commercial sector, but also from the um, emerging sector, which will be 3% higher than 2021, 2022 season's harvest. There are some who are saying, Minister, your, your idea of releasing 14,000 hectares of state land was, 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 was it 14,000? I could be wrong. It could be something else. I could be mixing my numbers. Okay, I will assist you. Yeah, please assist me. But <laughs> it, it, 14,000 yeah. release of state land yeah. was for human settlement purposes. Right. And most of those parcels of land were actually coming from state uh, land which is within a uh, public works which was given to human settlement for them to be able to develop at this, then, at yes, this point you, you were also then had your own program where you're actually releasing to farmers okay that's a, that's what i'm explaining to you Tom. all right <laughs> seven hundred thousand hectares of land mostly land that was under the South African Development Trust, which was procured actually by the then apartheid government for the consolidation of homelands. Most of these farms were actually closer to what you would call the barriers where homelands either ended and then there was, you know, need for expansion. But when 1994 happened, that process was not proceeded with. Majority of communities were utilizing that land without any form of security of tenure because that land neither was it communal nor was it commercial. So we announced that we will actually release this land to communities and individuals, meaning where such land was not encumbered, or not used by communities will then be allocated to the applicants who would have been successful. 5,000 applications is, is something that is reported to, to, you, you, you would have received. How many of those applications were successful? 5,000 individuals or 5,000 communities. I'm not sure where the figure comes from or 5,000. How many, how many applications did you, did you get for, 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 the, for the parcels of land that you were receiving? Well, at the moment, I may not be able to give you that figure, but I will provide it to you, Tabo. But we did receive applications from individuals, from people who were either coming together as cooperatives, as well as communities through their leaders, who actually requested that such land because has been used by their communities, they would appeal to the state right. that it be transferred to them. All right. Minister, we're out of time, unfortunately. We're going to have to leave it there. But thank you very much for coming on tonight. <laughs> thank you very much, Tavo. All right. That's uh, Minister of Agriculture and Land Reform. Uh, that is uh, Togo Didiza.